Well, good afternoon, everybody. <laughs> Welcome to the Columbus Metropolitan Club on this very, very hot Wednesday uh, afternoon in June. Uh, I'm Matt Barnes, morning co-anchor with NBC4 today and a member of the CMC Board of Trustees. Uh, today's live stream is presented by the Emergency Response Fund of the Columbus Foundation in partnership with the Columbus Dispatch and NBC4i. We want to thank all of those who are supporting today's forums. We'll give them a round of applause as well. All right, let's get to the good stuff here. Uh, the Columbus Zoo and Aquarium isn't just one of Central Ohio's must, most beloved attractions. It's a fan favorite around the country and frankly internationally known. However, events in the last several years at the zoo have included a bit of turmoil and controversy followed by the resignation of top zoo executives. So how can the zoo restore its reputation as our nation's leader in annual conservation and or animal conservation and education? To help answer these questions and more, please welcome Tom Schmidt, the new president and CEO of the Columbus Zoo and Aquarium, and our host with the most, Monica Day, co-anchor of NBC4 Today. You can learn more about today's speaker in our forum flyer. Monica, for once, I cede the stage to you. Oh, thank Enjoy. You. For once. Yeah. For once. <laughs> thank you, Matt. Uh, very excited to be here today to talk to you, Tom. Obviously, the Columbus Zoo is something um, that we all love, right? It's something we're proud of. <laughs> you have people in from out of town. You're like, you've got to go to our zoo. Your zoo isn't as good as our zoo. It just isn't. That's, that's a fact, uh, and I'll stand by that. Even people that come in from San Diego, I'm like, forget it. Come to the Columbus Zoo. Check it out. Um, but before we get started today, you are new to Columbus. Sure. You're new to most of the members here, to myself. Um, just give us a little information about you, your family, and how you got interested in this field to begin with. Sure, sure. So uh, first of all, thanks for the warm welcome, and, and that's certainly something that I've uh, experienced uh, everywhere I've been in this city. It, it's remarkable. The people here are, are just, um, I've always heard about sort of this Midwestern nice attitude, and, and it's nice to, to see it in action. So uh, I, uh, I was actually, I was born in Miami and, and grew up in South Florida and spent uh, most of my youth in the water, under the water, over the water, anything you can imagine having to do with seawater, we, we kind of did it. And so marine biology ended up being a, a logical career choice for me. And that was sort of the trajectory I, I, I took in college and, and in graduate school. And then um, uh, I was finishing up graduate school and um, I got an opportunity to, to um, work for SeaWorld to, to manage their shark collection. I thought that would be a nice, um, a nice detour maybe for a year or two after, after being in school for a while. And, uh, so I so I did that, and and I ended up staying there for about six years. So it really I think that opened my eyes to sort of this the zoo and aquarium field, um, environmental education, sort of the visitor attraction, all those kinds of things that were that were part of the the uh, the work that we did there. And so um, yeah, so that that kind of started the trajectory, and and then uh, spent a few years in Norfolk, Virginia, at um, kind of helping build a new. Aquarium Science Center um, and, and Naval uh, Historical Museum hybrid, if you will, um, and then really uh, I found that I enjoyed management, I enjoyed building, I enjoyed exhibit design, and and um, and then was recruited to uh, to to go to Texas to to be the chief operating officer for the Texas State Aquarium and then and then CEO. So. Um, and now I'm in Columbus, so th this was, you know, I've been trying to get up here ever since, so it's, uh, I'm excited to finally uh, get to the promised land, so, yeah. That's good, that's good. That's a really good attitude to have. We really appreciate that. We like you, we like you already. Um, you know, in kind of looking into your background, trying to get some information about you, it seems that in the field, um, people are really uh, quick to talk about your integrity, talk about your leadership um, and your ability to really relate to people and your honesty, um, which is obviously something that, that we need desperately here right now. One of the stories that stuck out to me was at the aquarium, I'm gonna paraphrase this, I'm gonna let you tell this story, um, that there was a product that was mislabeled and the results of, of your staff using this product were catastrophic. And instead of just keeping this quiet, you decided to go public with it. Why did you decide to really put it out there, and what result came back uh, because of that? Yeah, that, so that yeah, that was probably um, 
that was certainly the darkest day of my 20 years there. We um, we were we were doing a, a fish treatment, and and as you as you said, we um, we added a chemical to to our largest aquariums to to treat for some parasites, and and within a few hours, we realized something was wrong, and and um, and so the staff started collecting data, and um, I, I, I we no one really knew what happened. I mean, I I I. I so much confidence in the staff there. You know, the first thought was, well, they just displaced a decimal point, put too much chemical in. And I thought that that's almost certainly didn't happen. I said, there's got to be something wrong with this chemical. So we immediately started collecting samples. And um, I think it was the next day I, I sent an email to every zoo and aquarium director in, in North America. And I said, this is what happened. This is the drug we use. This is the amount we use. We, we just laid it all out because I was afraid that if there was something wrong with that chemical, uh, other facilities may be in the process of using it, and, and and we did the same thing with the press and the media, and and um, and sure enough, we found out that it actually had happened previously to several other institutions, um, but for whatever reason, they decided not to go public. I, I remember talking to some of the folks at the aquarium in New Orleans, and they said, "Tom, we had that on the shelf; we were ready to use it." And and so, we um, we we um, we sued the company, we sued the owner, um, and we got a million dollar summary judgment. But um, it uh, we never collected any money. They were really good at, at hiding their assets, but. Um, I guarantee there's not been another incident at another aquarium using that chemical. So, and and I, I remember I was talking to um, to to Doug Meyer who, who ran the San Diego Zoo at the time, and uh, and he said, you know, this is a good test case for how we need to handle things like this in our profession because, you know, if if people don't know, then then um, it can happen again. So yeah, it was that was a good learning lesson, but it was all about. You know transparency, and I told that to the staff. I said we're going to share everything. We're, we, we, this, this is something that everyone needs to understand, and, and it may end up reflecting poorly on us, but but we've got to get the information out. Yeah, because you think if the other people that had used the product that had the same results had they shared that, you know, that may not have happened. Um, so, which definitely leads us to what we've been dealing with here in Columbus. I just want to go through a timeline here. So in March of 2021. CEO and the CFO resign after this investigation. In April 2021, Jack Hanna's family, who is beloved, uh, announced that Jack is dealing with dementia. In the summer of 2021, a documentary comes out called The Confirma Conservation Game, and it really starts shedding a negative light on the zoo, on Jack, on some of the practices. In August of 2021, the forensic audit is released we now know that there was some very bad behavior going on. The zoo, in many ways, was kind of being run like a boys club, essentially. In October of 2021, the Association of Zoos and Aquariums pulls the accreditation. And then in December, you say, I'm going to leave this job that I've been at for 25 years to come to Columbus, in Ohio, to run this zoo and try to get them out of this mess. Why would you do that? Uh, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, you know, it was interesting when I first um, when I first heard about the opportunity. So I, I read the news and in, in in the spring of last year and just felt for the staff and and just um, but but didn't really give it a lot of thought at the time. I mean, obviously, there's been a lot of things happening in our world over the last several years. So, um, but I was um, I was actually traveling in New York and I got a call from a recruiter about this opportunity and um, and I remember thinking to myself, this is this is arguably one of the best zoos in the country. Um, I, I, you know, and so I told my wife, I said, look, you know, I, I, I know we're happy. I know things are good in Texas. This is the best zoo job in the country. I said, I'm, I, I'm, I'm probably not even going to be competitive. I work for a sort of a mid-sized aquarium, but I mean, they, they approached me. I, I got to put my name in the hat. And so I told her that and, and, um, and, and she was all in. And, and, uh, I think, you know, I, I remember reading one time Tim Cook from Apple was giving a commencement address and he talked about, you know, he's trying to inspire these, these, these young students and he talked about in, in life you have different pathways and you, you can, you know, you can sail toward the calm seas and that's comfortable, but, you know, if you chart a course toward a storm, that, that's really sometimes where you find your purpose. And, and I feel like that, that that's a little bit why I wanted to come here. It, it seemed to me that my skill set was, was was maybe what the zoo could use and, and might be beneficial and and um, uh, it, the 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 Texas State Aquarium was not in great shape when I got there and and so um, uh, we were able to accomplish a lot there and and um, 
it just it just seemed like a, an amazing opportunity to to help lead one of the best zoos in the country. And as I looked at all the details and the forensic audit, I thought to myself, these are these are things that are major challenges, but they're all solvable. I mean, this is so um, yeah. So here I am. So one of the things that came out of this was losing um, the AZA accreditation. For folks that aren't familiar, what exactly does that do? What was the impact on the zoo by losing that? Yeah. Well, it, it's um, it, it's interesting. Uh, you know, the Columbus Zoo had been a, an accredited member of the AZA for, for decades, and um, the it, it's a great trade association member serving organization. Um, we we have a very comprehensive um, uh, animal management program that we work with other zoos on, and it's it's largely um, coordinated and, and orchestrated by the AZA and their staff and, and a whole group of volunteers. So. Being able to be part of that network is is vital. There's there's continuing education opportunities. I mean, there's a lot of upside to being a member of the association. The accreditation process, obviously, is something that we that we hold very dear. And and um, but from a public perception view, um, we really found that it, it had almost no impact to our operations. I, I think, as you mentioned, you know, the, the zoo is very well thought of in this community, and and I don't think anyone in the community question whether or not we were taking care of the animals. It's clear that we do that every day in, in, in all of our facilities. So I think where we had the biggest impact was we had uh, curators who managed some of these, these, um, these, these species programs and in some cases had worked decades to get into a leadership position and they were told they had to step down through no fault of their own. So that, that was really, I think that was the hardest part from my perspective. Um, but there are other accrediting bodies out there. So, so we were able to get an accreditation by the Alliance for Marine Mammal Parks and Aquariums last fall. They focus pretty specifically on marine mammals, uh, polar bears, pinnipeds, things like that. And then most recently, we were accredited by the Zoological Association of America, which is a, um, it's a younger uh, organization, not quite as large, um, but um, it's one that's growing rapidly. And, and so they had uh, several inspectors on site earlier this year, um, you know, spending 10, 11 hours a day going through every aspect of our animal care, our animal well-being program, conservation, safety, security, a very comprehensive audit, and, and we achieved that accreditation. So uh, I felt good about that. We will uh, pursue AZA accreditation in the fall of this year, and um, and I'm confident we'll get it back again because when the inspection team was here last summer, we actually met the standard. And, and so, but unfortunately, uh, I think the commission just felt that, you know, based on the things that had happened, they really wanted to um, give the zoo a little bit more time to demonstrate that the changes that were made um, will continue. At least that's how it was explained to me. Uh, I, I don't agree with the decision, but I do accept it. You and spent uh, some time with the AZA, right? Yeah, I served on the, on the board for, for eight years and have done dozens of accreditation inspections all over the world. So I, I do understand the process, and, and I don't think they made the right decision. But, but again, we're, we're, we're moving forward. The Wilds continues their AZA accreditation. They never lost it, and they'll, um, they actually are going through their inspection this summer, and, and I'm confident that in the fall they'll be accredited once again. So. You know, from a staff perspective, it was really difficult. Um, many of our animal keepers would, would probably never consider working for a zoo that wasn't accredited. And yeah. so, but they stayed with us. And, and all of our partners, with the exception of two, um, two zoos that are, that are run by new directors that just happen to be on the AZA board, are still working with us, just not participating at the same level as the rest of our partners. But um, as we found with Biko, the 13-year-old the, 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 the Asian elephant that, that succumbed to EEHV, over the weekend, we had an army of, of teams from St. Louis, from, from, from Texas, from Florida, from Cincinnati, from the National Zoo in Washington, uh, Denver Zoo, I mean, uh, professionals coming in, helping us, elephants donating plasma to those animals. It was a remarkable um, collaboration and, and supportive community that helped us care for Biko, and the issue of AZA never came up once. That's good to know. Uh, since you touched on that, can you just express to us what it is like uh, for the folks at the zoo when one of the animals is going through something like sure. that or the loss of an animal? What, what yeah. is that like for you all? Yeah, it's, uh, it, it's, it's hard to really understand. I mean, we all we, we love our dogs. We love our cats. We love our, our pets that we have. But imagine if your only job in life was to care for your dog 8, 10, 12 hours a day then you begin to get a sense of, of what some of our staff 
um, uh, feel like when they do lose an animal. And it doesn't necessarily have to be a, a mega vertebrate like an elephant. It can be a snake or it even can be a shark or, or a bird. They just develop such a strong bond with these animals. And, and, and that's one of the reasons why I think our animal wellness program is, is, is so strong at the zoo. Um, but it, it's, it's incredibly difficult. You know, when, um, as, a, as a kid in Columbus, Jack Hanna was just, you know, it. I mean, he was the celebrity, still, you know, still is, um, of Central Ohio. And really, I think, for many of us, started this love of animals. Um, when this documentary came out, when these things were being said, and he wasn't in really a position to defend himself, a lot of us started to wonder, will the zoo try to separate itself from the legacy of Jack Hanna. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, well, the short answer is no. Uh, uh, you know, Jack had, has, has, such, has had a profound impact on the Columbus Zoo. And, and um, you know, I, I really only had a chance to meet Jack once, and it was about 10 or 15 years ago at a, at a conference. And he and I shared a cab ride together. And, uh, you know, I'd never met him. He'd never met me. And it was just such a... He was so warm and, and, and funny and, and just, I mean, we hit it off. And, and I, I remember thinking to myself, you know, this is exactly the same guys I see on TV. I mean, he was, he was so authentic. And I think, you know, toward the end with, with some of our uh, animal management programs where we were working with institutions that we probably shouldn't have been working with, I don't think Jack knew that. I think Jack made the same mistake, essentially, that our board made. They trusted the leadership. And, and they, without verifying, but, but they ultimately trusted the people they worked with. And so uh, I can't imagine um, when, when he indicated that some of those cheetah cubs that he assumed were coming from the Columbus Zoo and then didn't, I, I can't imagine he, he didn't know that. I, I, I'm convinced that he thought, yeah, they came from the Columbus Zoo. We've always done it this way. And, and so it is. It's unfortunate. It's, you know, the timing on that was, was, was tragic. And, um, but, no, his, his legacy will, it will remain, absolutely. And for a lot of people, you know, they wonder, well, how have these programs changed? You know, at the TV station, we would have animals come into the station. Um, the staff, of course, always cared for these animals deeply, had a lot of information to share with our viewers. How have those programs changed and some of the hands-on programs sure. at the zoo? So, we, we, yeah, we certainly are not doing as much um, outreach nationally as we used to. Uh, we're, we're not bringing any cheetahs off-site. Um, I don't have a cheetah with me today. Some folks might have been expecting that. But, um, uh, you know, we've learned so much. We've always known a lot about animal care and animal health, but I think this whole sort of field of animal well-being, uh, it's something that I think we, we in this profession have really begun to focus on over the last five to ten years. And, it, and again, it's, it's beyond just animal care and health. It's the... It's, you know, are animals comfortable? Are they ultimately happy? I mean, we want to be able to answer that question when folks come to our zoo, is that animal happy? And, and we now have science and data and observations to, to begin answering that question. And so as we, as we look at our outreach programs through that lens, we have to make sure that in addition to just meeting their animal care needs, that, that, that we really are maintaining their animal well-being. And oftentimes that means giving the animals choice for what they do, um, giving them opportunities to do different things. And so sometimes that's difficult in an outreach program. So I think um, a, a lot of that work it, we're now doing under or through the lens of animal well-being. And so I think you'll probably see us continue to do outreach locally and, and maybe regionally uh, with different tacks, so probably not, not as wide a collection of animals as we used to, because I think there's still something really compelling to be able to bring a, a small piece of the zoo to a community that may not be able to come to the zoo. Because so. if you don't see the animals, how can you care about them? How can you make a difference? Yeah, yeah it, it, it's, uh, I mean, TV, everything, there's lots of opportunities on the yeah. Internet now, but they're, they're, we, we have an innate biophilia. I mean, we, we have an innate genetically programmed desire to be with animals, and, and that's, that's something that I think zoos do well, and I think that's something that that will ultimately benefit the species if we can get that connection happening in our facilities. Uh, before we go any further, I do want to touch on, I don't want to call it the elephant in the room, that's just a little too, too on, on the nose, but, um, you know, when we talk about this report, when we talk about the forensics, when we talk about, you know, the former CEO and, and, and the folks that were really kind of abusing their position, I know you weren't involved with that, you weren't here, but how are you ensuring your staff, how are you ensuring the public um, and the donors that that is not going to happen again? 
So it, one of you know when I first um, began meeting with some of our, our the search committee, uh, you know, I, I I mean I clearly understood that that job one is restoring trust. We've got to be able to restore trust uh, to to the Columbus Zoo, and and um, that will happen with with a lot of listening, a lot of learning from my perspective. It'll happen with with open communication, lots of transparency. Um, and so those are the things that, that I've tried to do over the last, you know, 90 to, to 180 days to, to, to begin to facilitate that process. But honestly, much of that started before I came here. So um, I think I shared with you earlier, you know, we had, we had four guys that did some really bad things, and, and they're gone now. And we had a team of women who, who rose up and, and led the institution, and, and a lot of them are sitting at the table here. You know, they're the ones that did the heavy lifting. They're the ones that, that made the changes and worked with the board um, and, and really got the ship righted so that when I could come in, I was in a, in a much stronger position. And, and I'm very thankful for Jerry Bourne, our, our former leader from years ago, who also came back and volunteered his time to help lead the organization. So uh, if you look at all the things that we've done through what we learned through the forensic audit, Brent Jackson, who, who chairs our audit committee, you know, they are on task every month making sure that we're following the procedures, that we have the right procedures in place. We just did a, a, a fairly exhaustive board governance review. Uh, so Laura McDonald with Benefactor Group um, led that study. We, we've talked to a number of community leaders. Um, we talked to peer organizations around the country. We chose nine zoos that we thought were good peer groups to really understand best practices. And, and we, we, you know, we're going to soon be rolling out the results of that study, and I think you'll see some governance changes within our organization. So I think that we're, we're doing all the things that need to be done. We've got to make sure that we communicate that clearly to the public, and, um, and I think we will win back that trust. You know, when I think about the zoo, I think it's great. You know, but when you're coming in with fresh eyes, there's always room to improve, room to grow. Um, what are some of the things that you hope to change at the zoo that would be visible for all of us? Yeah, well, it is. It, it's a great zoo. Um, you know, we've done some amazing, the team has done some amazing exhibits. I think the, the Heart of Africa savanna is probably the best savanna habitat of any zoo in North America. I think, I think our, our polar bear habitat is probably top three. So really some amazing uh, habitats, um, but they're habitats where many of these animals spend about six or seven months a year during the warmer times of the year. Um, we have other areas at the zoo where animals spend a significant amount of time behind the scenes in, in indoor habitats, in some cases for, for five, six months out of the year, and they're, they're not to that level of quality. And so we have already identified a number of areas where we're going to improve some of the indoor habitats. For example, our bonobos. Um, we're, we're working on, a, uh, we're actually working on detailed design drawings now to significantly improve the indoor space for those animals. We did that for orangutan, and I think it's been a, a, a great success for us. So that's going to be continue to be a good, a, a strong focus for us, making sure that we've got amazing spaces for these animals to live year round and, and not just in the summertime. And then from our guest perspective as well, we want to make sure that the zoo is a place where guests want to visit year round and not just in, in June and July. So coming up with more experiences where our guests can get out of the elements and see some of these animals I think is a, a real key to our long-term sustainability. So we, um, in addition, we, we've got a big focus on the North America region right now, so a major development there. And then um, we'll be looking at, at some other areas of the zoo. But we're, we're about halfway through a strategic planning process. I hope to finish that up with the board and our senior team um, sometime probably in August, September. And then we will move into our framework development, which will be a, the master plan that, that guides our growth for the next, uh, the next eight to 10 years. And, and I can't share any details yet, but it will be transformational. OK. Now, you know, you're coming from an aquarium. You're an, an aquarium type guy. Are we thinking any expansion to the aquarium portion of the zoo or my favorite area, the manatees? Manatees. Well, we we actually have Asking one of the. A friend. We have we have one of the. I think we have one of the best manatee habitats, yeah. and and that's a program that we've been involved with for for several decades. We got four additional orphan manatees last year, so we are we're kind of full right yeah. now. But there there's still a need. So um, I think working with our partners to to help them determine maybe how they can build facilities similar to ours probably would be a next good step. The aquarium component is, it's a little small and it's a little dated. And, and um, if you think so, I think Columbus is the 14th largest city in the, in the country. Um, we're probably the largest city 
in the country that doesn't have a true standalone aquarium. And I think that's largely because the Columbus Zoo has filled that need. So I think there certainly would be opportunities to, to dramatically uh, improve that, that part of our program. If you need help with the manatees, <laughs> let me know. I'm, I've got a day job, but I get off early, so I could be, I could be there. I could be there to help out. Um, you know, we've touched a lot on the zoo, and for many people in Central Ohio, they've never been to the wilds, and, and it's just an incredible place to visit. Um, what are you going to do to expand that, to try to get more people out there? And are there any expansion plans for the wilds? Yeah, the wilds is a remarkable facility. So when I when I first came to interview, uh, that that really was I think the other piece of the equation that 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 got me excited about the future of, of our of our organization. Um, I spent three or four hours out there actually with with Dr. Jan Raymer, and I'd never been there before. I'd always heard about it, but it is it's a remarkable asset. And I think in some cases. Um, it, it really is the future of, of a modern zoological facility. And, and so, I mean, if you think about um, pretty much every major city in the country has a, has a really good zoo, very, very few, if any, have a 10,000-acre wildlife conservation center that's, that's an hour and a half away. So um, I think the future out there is still largely unwritten. We're also going through a strategic planning process there with, with Dr. Joe Smith, who is our, our leader out there. Um, I think more opportunities for guests to, to spend the night out there. It, that's a, it's so big and there's so many things to do. You can't do it in a two or three hour visit. And so that's why I think the lodging has become so popular out there. So next month we'll break ground on a new camp, campground, an RV campground, which will be a, a wonderful opportunity and a little bit different price point for folks to be able to enjoy uh, what we have out there. Um, but no, there, we, we've got a lot of really exciting ideas that really are grouped into how can we, again, like at the zoo, how can we extend that season, uh, really where our wildlife conservation focus will be, what taxa we'll focus on, uh, the restoration ecology work. Uh, there's just, there, there's so many opportunities for guest experiences, for wildlife conservation research, the science that we can do out there, because it essentially is largely a natural habitat. When I was out there uh, this past summer, uh, when we were on the tour, one of the guides mentioned their desire to have black rhinos. Um, is there any talk of trying to create a habitat so that you can have another species out yeah, there? We've actually, we've, we've talked about a number of different taxa that, that really need space and, and, and need room to roam. We have, we have incredible expertise out there with our teams. We, uh, we have a really sophisticated veterinary program. So, uh, yeah, that's, that's any, we're talking about a lot of different species now trying to pin you down on yeah. what's happening at the if you haven't been out there stay, stay in the yurt yeah. I mean it's the experience is absolutely incredible um, the people that run the zoo each day I'm talking the people that you know, welcome you to the zoo they're in the gift shops uh, they're walking around kind of your guest service folks what was their response to everything that happened uh, last year I think um, you know one of the one of the things I did during during kind of my first few months at at the zoo was um, so we have about 34 different departments there and and I really wanted to meet one on one with with all of our teams and and so I did that and um, you know the the um, it was a, it was a range I mean clearly everyone was disappointed they were hurt you know I think almost any company suffered during COVID you know, either through layoffs or, or cutbacks. And so, you know, that put a, a level of stress on the teams and then compounded with that, you know, when they learned about what their leaders were doing, I think it really just, you know, the, I, I sensed some PTSD with some of our teams, teams when I met with them. And so, um, uh, you know, they just, they, they, they wanted to know what was going on. There wasn't a lot of transparency. And, and so um, I think they were hurt, um, but, it's an amazingly resilient group of people. And, and I think they, like our community, understood that, that the, the zoo itself is an amazing institution and it's gonna move forward. Yes, there were a few guys that did some, some bad things, but the, 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 the entity itself is strong and, and remains strong. And, and I think they got that. And, and I think just having an opportunity to, to share with me how they were feeling, I think was, was somewhat cathartic. I mean, there's still a lot more that we need to do um, but it, it's, it's been a challenge, but I would say that most would probably recognize now it, it is a new day at the zoo. What do you think is um, your biggest challenge right now? I mean, obviously we're coming off the pandemic, staffing's an issue for everyone, everything that's happened. What are you the most concerned about right now? Oh yeah, so um, it, it, it's a, uh, it is a large organization. So we have essentially 
four different companies, four different boards, and in two different cities, um, over over 300 employees and and nearly 3,000 seasonal workers in, in all four venues. So um, I think just understanding you know what's happening in each division, where the risks are, where the opportunities are. Um, prioritizing, I think, has been been a challenge trying to determine. I mean, there's so many things to do, and and I I remember I I, I spoke with the staff uh, a couple weeks ago. You know, and some days I wake up and I think we're not moving quickly enough, and then other days I, I think we're moving too quickly. And I will share with you that, uh, that thanks to Nana, I was invited to to listen to our new police chief uh, Elaine Bryant, and after hearing what she's done over the last year coming in as, as, as the first, first black female police chief in a department that's 89% white male, uh, I don't feel like I'm not moving too quickly. I mean, I, I feel like I'm not, it, she has done so much that, that she was kind of, a, it, was a, it was an inspirational sort of uh, process for me to think we, we just need to keep moving and we need to keep moving quickly. So I think it's just prioritizing to make sure that, that we are moving ahead in all the different areas that we need to and, and, and just trying to figure out a way that we can maintain that cadence. You know, obviously coming into the job, you're familiar with what the zoo is going through. You're familiar with the zoo and the work of the zoo. But was there anything that really shocked you coming in? Um, probably not shocked, but, but the, I think the... Um, Employee morale w was was more challenging than I anticipated, and I should have expected that. But um, again, I think when I had a chance to meet with all those teams, and just seeing um, you know what they had gone through, and and still looking at how resilient they were, that was that was uh, that was more surprising than than I anticipated. I know that we touched on the care of the animals, um, and a lot of people questioned were any of the animals being neglected yeah. or, or, or treated poorly. But the care at the zoo, it, it is at the level that we've always anticipated that it is. Absolutely, and, and that's what I think was a little frustrating too with, with the AZA process. Uh, it, it, yes, we some bad things occurred. They were rectified. No one was killed, no one was hurt, no animals were killed, no animals were hurt. Essentially, you know, nine or ten cheetah cubs came to the zoo from facilities that we wouldn't work with today. They were arguably cared for very well while they were at the zoo. They went back to those facilities. That, on the animal end, that was essentially the extent of it. And, and so, again, not, not, none of this had anything to do with the animals that are on site at the zoo. So. Um, I, I think sometimes we just have to put these things into proportion. And again, with the you know with our with the with the misspending of our former executives, we, we documented somewhere between seven and eight hundred thousand dollars worth of, of of misappropriated funds or misspending, if you will. Um, most of that now has 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 been returned to us. Uh, and you know we're over a hundred million dollar a year organization. So again, I think putting these kinds of things into perspective sometimes is important. The funds that are coming back, are they going to a specific place? What, what's, what's happening with those uh, funds? No, right now they're still in our operating, oper operating budget, yeah. And with the pandemic, you know, obviously everyone took a hit. You, you, you couldn't be open. Um, so how did that affect operations there, you know, from a fiscal standpoint? Yeah. Well, 2020 clearly was a very difficult year. I mean, we were closed for several months. We, we, had, to, we had to let go some of our teams. Um, and even when people returned, they certainly didn't return into um, into a, a, the levels that we had seen in, in the past, and so um, that was a you know that was a really difficult year. But as COVID started to recede a little bit, you know, 2021, despite you know some of the challenges you mentioned, it was actually a remarkably successful year for the zoo. You know, we saw 2.7 million visits at all of our parks. Um, it was, uh, I mean, it was a phenomenally successful year from a financial perspective. Um, we, we expanded our community access programming. I think we probably gave away between five and 7,000 tickets to the zoo to various entities, working with the Columbus Metro Libraries and other groups. So um, I think there was a lot of, uh, there's such a, 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 dis, a, dis, a, a distance between really financially what happened in 20 and 21. And fortunately that momentum is still carrying us through 2022 tell you that your zoo kids program is still very difficult to get into. I got my daughter in the last spot and I was like, yes. <laughs> I, think, I, think, I think moms and dads were anxious for their kids to go to summer camp this summer. Imagine that. Yeah. yeah. Go. Have a whole lot of fun. Bye-bye. <laughs>
Um, speaking of children and some of your outreach programs, are there any new partnerships on the horizon to try to get more people either to the zoo or to the zoo um, into our communities? Yeah, so one of the things that we did this year is, is uh, uh, Nala Key, who does a lot of our, our community outreach, works a lot with, with Nicole and I. Uh, we started meeting with some of the settlement houses in, 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 in Columbus, and we thought they might be able to be good partners to be able to help us provide more access to the zoo. And I think that program has worked out really well. So we continue to distribute um, uh, admission passes to those centers. They give them to the, to the folks that they work with. And, and so I think that's been a good, successful program. And then, uh, you know, I touched on the program with the Columbus uh, Metropolitan Library. We're actually expanding uh, a similar program in Muskegon County so that folks in Muskegon County can come to the, to the wilds by simply going to the library and checking out some passes. So I think just trying to come up with innovative ways to, to, to make the zoo more accessible. We realize that transit is still a challenge, and so we, you know, we continue to work with CODA to, um, to actually run a line to the zoo over the summer and we're looking at ways that we can maybe expand that. So as many of the barriers that we can that we can break down to allow folks to come to the zoo, we're gonna continue to focus on that. And why is that so important? Why is that such a focus? Because it seems like it always has been. Yeah. Well, it, you know, Columbus Zoo, it, it's known around the country, it's known around the world, but at the end of the day, it's the Columbus Zoo. And so we wanna make sure uh, that we're that we are accessible to, to everyone in the community and that and that you know folks who don't have the financial wherewithal they, they I mean they they those kids need a zoo experience just as much as anyone and and so that that's going to continue to be a focus of ours there are many people that are happy to to pay full price to come to the zoo there's probably a lot of people that would actually pay even more knowing some of the work that we do in terms of accessibility and wildlife conservation so um, th there's plenty of ways that we can build a business model that will continue to allow us to, to be financially successful, but still maintain that accessibility, because I think that's vital. That's important. I think we're about ready for the questions. Are we ready for the online questions? Mm. Well, just one more question. Okay, and then we'll start with, uh, with some of y'all's questions. Don't try to get my manatee job. I'm already, I'm already trying to get in there for that. <laughs> um, one of the things that we touched on was what you might have been surprised by um, going in there, but as you've entered the zoo, what is now something that you're very excited about? Well, we, we have amazing capability there. We, we, have, um, we have a staff that, that is, is, I think, probably the best in the country. They, they, um, they're so skilled. I mean, that, that's the most important resource that we have is our human resource. And, and um, uh, so I think the opportunities to, to expand on that are, are, are remarkable. Uh, one example, so we, in the state of Ohio, there are seven diplomat wildlife medicine veterinarians. So seven diplomat in the entire state of Ohio, five work for the Columbus Zoo. So the ability, we, we have some of the just remarkably talented uh, scientists that, that work as, as veterinarians at the zoo and they, um, they're, they're pretty much spending you know, 50 to 60 hours a week caring for our 10,000 animals and if we can get some 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 assistance for them, I think there's an opportunity for them to do more research. So, um, I, 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 we, we've we've supported wildlife conservation around the country, around the world, and we're going to continue to do that. But I really want to expand our research uh, capability because I think we have the capacity to do that. We just need to uh, we just need to give a little bit more flexibility to our teams to be able to pursue some of that work. And really, that goes to a lot of our curators um, that that are just renowned in in the community in terms of their their expertise and talent so getting them more out in the field so they can actually do more field work I think is a goal so just lots of opportunity and and it's because we have such an amazing team there and I think now we will move to the questions from the live stream and the audience um, so if you have questions make your way up to the microphone and then if you're watching online you can type your questions into the chat um, so that we will have those. You know, you kind of touched on the the research and everything. The um, Secrets of the Zoo, the show that we're all watching, I think it's interesting too to watch the relationship that you have with the Ohio State University and some of the, the veterinarians that, that come there. Is that normal for um, for a zoo to have such a close working relationship with a university like that? Yeah, well, I think it, it's normal. I mean, when we were in Texas, we had a good relationship with the College of Veterinary Medicine at Texas A&M um, in Galveston uh, or in, in College Station. but. I think the level that we take it here is very unique. So we've, we have, um, I think, probably one of the strongest, most comprehensive 
um, residency programs of probably any institution in, in the U.S. So it's a three-year program. Uh, those residents spend one year at the zoo, one year at the wilds, and one year at Ohio State. So it's a three-year program, comprehensive. Um, we, we have dozens and dozens of people applying for these, many that are already well into their career yeah. because it's such a unique opportunity. So I think that is a real strength for us that, that I'm not sure exists in any other zoo around the country. I have to tell you, my dog's orthopedic surgeon was on the show, and I got very excited. Mm. I, felt like I, was a, I felt like I was a part of it. Well, yeah, and so many collaborating, uh, collaborating veterinarians, both locally and regionally. It, it's pretty remarkable. Yeah. And yes, I did say my dog's orthopedic surgeon. It wasn't cheap. Uh, <laughs> I think we have our, our first question. Yes, yeah, so I'm Antra Moody. I'm curating questions online. Um, thank you to everyone for being here. Thank you, Monica, for hosting. Thank you, Tom, for being here as well. Our first question is from Carol Mary. What does the zoo plan to do to repair reputation in addition to accreditation? Is there a need for reputation repair, or is the reputation so strong that it can just go on past the scandal? Well, that's a, that's a really good question, and that's exactly the question I was asking myself when, when, I, when I joined the team. And um, as you know, I mentioned, you know, talking, spending a lot of time talking to our, our teams, I also spent a fair amount of time uh, meeting with stakeholders in the community, so our, our county commissioners and, and city leaders and, and not-for-profit leaders. And, and, just a, and my sense was that there, there is a lot of uh, pride still in the zoo. And for example, all of our corporate partners continue to want to partner with us and support us. And so anecdotally, I was getting a lot of um, great information that that the zoo's brand was was essentially strong, and but but I thought you know we really need to we need to get some data. So we actually did a a pretty comprehensive market research study this spring. We we interviewed we had a company that interviewed about a thousand people uh, in the central Ohio region. We asked a whole series of questions, but but specifically about their their impressions of the zoo and. Uh, I was really fortunate, uh, we were really fortunate um, when we saw those results. So the, the, the positivity value was at 95%. So 95% of the people that we surveyed had a positive view of the zoo. Uh, somewhere between 3 and 4% had no opinion whatsoever of the zoo, which is okay. And there was virtually no one that had a negative impression of the zoo. And, and so um, I felt, you know, that was that was the data point that we needed. Now that doesn't mean we still need to work hard every day to 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 keep that reputation. And as all the things that I mentioned before about the communication and the transparency, we we need to make sure that we're maintaining all of that. But again, I think the 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 general public, our community, I think they can separate the actions of a few individuals with with the with the amazing team that 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 is at the zoo now. Tom, first, welcome to Central Ohio. Thank you. Uh, my name is Steve Gravencamper, and I'm a psychologist. You talked about the low morale and kind of the trust had been broken by leadership. Can you kind of give us two or three tips for other leaders based on your experiences on things that you think are helpful yeah. as they might deal with similar issues? Yeah. Well, the, the one, and it's pretty simple, but it's just listen. Uh, you know, I, I, I can distinctly remember several times when I, when I met with the teams um, you know, some of them broke down. I had, I had, you know, folks that said, you know, I've, I've worked at the zoo for six years. I've never had a conversation with anyone from leadership. So um, I think it was just knowing that they had a voice, knowing that they could be heard um, went, went, I think, a, a long way to begin repairing and, and restoring that trust. And, and um, under Carmen's leadership, uh, she's our, our senior VP of, of Human Resources, we did a really comprehensive employee engagement survey that, that looked at every department, looked at really what, what's making them tick, where the issues are, and so we now have action plans into place that, that address those. And I will say a lot of it's common sense. It's, it's communication. It's, it's making sure that teams know what's going on. Uh, no one or not everyone may agree with every decision that we make, but if we at least explain why we're making that decision, that, 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 that always hadn't been the case. And so getting them to understand the process that we go through when we have to make decisions I think is important. Uh, making sure they have a voice, making sure they're heard, they're understood. Um, I think all those things are, are really beginning to, to build that morale back up. All right, so we have another online question. This is from Kathy Fox. Are you able to discuss or, yes, talk about any new animals that the zoo will have as their new home and are there any new breeding program opportunities? Oh, that's a good question. So, um, well, and, and so I have to, again, I, I want to I be 100% transparent. Um, 
as, as we look over the next five to 10 years at the Columbus Zoo, I can almost guarantee there probably will be less animals at the zoo rather than more. And, and part of that is because of the realization that we are gonna focus on the taxa that we can have the most impact with and, and this, this notion of continuing to build collections to, to, to create new experiences, that really is, is not a model that I think is, is working as well for the modern zoo these days. So um, what, what our goals really will be, um, we want to continue to, to breed animals, we want to continue to sustain the populations, but we want to increase the size of their habitats, we want to make sure that there's more opportunities for the animals which require space. So um, that, that's sort of the short answer now. I will share that I'm pretty intrigued with the, with the Madagascar region because one of our uh, uh, veterinarians has been going down there studying lemur populations for 20 years. So that could be an opportunity for us to, to talk about some new areas um, and talk about some new uh, conservation work um, focused on Madagascar. But generally speaking, um, uh, we're, we're not going to be bringing a lot of new taxa into the zoo. I mean, we want to certainly maintain what we have. We want to work with our partners. Um, and we'll continue to uh, to work with them. And, and I think as we're discovering, you know, each zoo has its expertise. And so if there's a, if there's a zoo that is really exceptionally good at one taxa, then we, you know, that that zoo may increase their collection. Other zoos uh, may end up cutting back on their collection a little bit. If you look at the sustainability of elephants, for example, um, it's it's not great right now. And and if you look, there's I'm. I don't remember the number, but let's say there's 45 or 50 zoos in the country that currently have African and Asian elephants. If you look at the population dynamics uh, over the last 10 to 20 years, and if those continue, there won't be 45 zoos that have elephants 10 years from now. There might be 25 zoos. So, you know, zoos are having to make really difficult decisions about what their animal uh, collection plan looks like and what taxa they want to focus on. Pandas in 2025? Uh, <laughs> probably not. No. I don't okay. want to say never, but but probably. Not. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, I'm Bill Wehoff with Steptoe and Johnson PLLC. We want to thank you for your leadership mm. and the leadership of the table uh, immediately adjacent to you. Yeah. And I wondered, has uh, <laughs> has uh, staffing at the wilds for tours and whatnot ever been an issue, and what, if anything, if it has, what, if anything, uh, is is the organization doing to, you know, staff up yeah, uh, out it, there? It, it, so Thank you it, very much. Yeah, it, it, we have, it's a challenge, it, well, it's a challenge across all of our venues, so um, we, uh, that that's probably the other major challenge that we continue to have is just staffing levels, particularly with seasonal staff, and I think at the wilds in Muskegon County, again, that's an area that, that um, you know, it's, it's, it's an hour, hour and a half from Columbus, so they have to draw on a smaller population base. We did raise our minimum wage to, to $13 an hour. I'm hopeful we can get that to $15 an hour uh, next year. I think that did have an impact. Um, the other thing that we did at the wilds, traditionally, because they're a smaller organization, uh, their benefits weren't necessarily on par with what the teams were at the zoo, and, and we changed that this year. So now they have their benefit package, I think, is, is, is equally as strong and robust as the one at the zoo. So I think that's helped. So, again, just focusing on what the employees need, their compensation, uh, their benefits, making sure they're competitive. Um, it's, uh, you know, a lot of folks sacrifice to work, work at our facilities, and we don't want them to sacrifice too much. We really want to make sure that, that we're paying them the appropriate wage. So, but, but it has been a challenge. All right, this question is from Emily Sandman and Carol Mary. Um, can you discuss a little bit more about the conservation efforts? Um, what are zoos accomplishing with wild animal populations? And what does research show regarding zoo attendance and the public's conservation views and actions? That's okay. a lot. So. Well, I should turn that over to, to Dr. Michael Krieger, who, who is our VP of Conservation Biology. He, he could answer that in, in, in much greater detail than I could, but I know we don't have a lot of time. So really, our, if, you, if you think about the wildlife conservation work we do, we, we can kind of break it down into a couple of different buckets. The first and foremost is just really saving species from extinction, targeting populations that are at risk and, and trying to do what we can to support them in the wild through, through, through research, through grant funding, through support. Um, and we do that in Ohio, we do that all over the country, we do it all over the world. So that, that's sort of one bucket, I think, last year 
probably 77 different projects in, in, in several dozen countries. Um, the other one is actually animal rescue. So it's, it's a, a little bit different than animal concert, wildlife conservation in that if there are populations that are, that are in need, for example, you know, penguin chicks right now are having challenges uh, in South Africa, and so we're sending support uh, funding to, to help care for those animals. Uh, the, the zoo has supported cold-stunning sea turtle work. Our entire manatee program essentially is a wildlife rescue effort. You know, these are animals that, that are having huge challenges in, in the waters in Florida. And, and uh, you know, we get orphan calves that would not be able to survive on their own, so they find a home in, in, an, in an aquarium or zoo like, like Columbus. So that's another big piece. And then another one that I think is really interesting is knowing, and, and I think it's probably the future of a lot of our wildlife conservation work, that we can't just focus on the animals. We have to focus on the populations, the indigenous populations in those regions. In many cases, the wildlife is under threat because of interactions they have with the humans, and, and they may be competing for the same resource. And so figuring out ways that we can help and strengthen communities so they don't have to rely as much on, on poaching or, or things like that, I think that's a core focus of a lot of the conservation work that the Columbus Zoo has traditionally done and will continue to do. Um, but really, I think uh, going forward, um, looking at, 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 at projects, probably multi-year projects, significant funding, you know, I'd like to be able to, 10 years from now, we go back and say, you know, we did some things in, in 2023 and 2024, and now this is a species that we've helped save from extinction. I mean, that really will be the success factor that we look at in the future. I was struck by that, and you'll probably know the animal. I was at the wilds six, seven years ago, and there was a horse that was, like, on the verge. Yeah. And, and then when I was there this time, they said, you know, with our help, we've helped to, you know, to put these, these animals back, um, you know, increase the numbers. And that was amazing to think that right here in Ohio, yeah. what was the, what's the horse called? Chevalsky horse. Chevalsky horse, thank you. I knew you would know. <laughs> um, you know, so, but it was amazing because that you see it. You see yeah. it actually happening in just a matter of years from visiting once to visiting again. The work that that was done and really yeah, these are, these good are, job. These are collaborative projects that we work with with many of our zoo partners in in, in the U.S. and in Europe and, and conservation partners mm -hmm. around the world. And in fact, this is kind of not so good news, but we were actually scheduled to release some of these horses in Russia this year, uh -huh. and we had to we put that on hold for for some obvious oh, reasons. So yeah. yeah, that's unfortunate. Hi, Jeffrey Feld and Scientific Consulting. I um, want to welcome you to Central Ohio. Like Thank you, this is, I, I'm a recent transplant. This is probably your first real winter like me, so I'm glad we survived that. Um, so um, you mentioned a, a few aspects of some of the research that the zoo's done. It sounds really exciting. So I was wondering if you can talk a little bit more specifically about one like ongoing research study that you're most excited about, whether it's a collaboration with, with Ohio State or if it's something specific to the zoo. Um, how you're communicating that to the public, how it's becoming broadcasted, and how that communication can really help strengthen your um, relationship with the public. Yeah, well, the you know the one that comes to mind, unfortunately, it's a it's a pretty sad story, but um, there's a, there's a virus EEHV that that elephants are susceptible to, and and we ended up losing Biko, our 13 year old Asian elephant, over the weekend due to that virus. So we're 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 as we speak now developing a laboratory on site that can test for that. And so that will be, it will, it will be a testing site, so not only for our animals, but if there are elephants in, in nearby zoos that, that need that assistance. And so working with the partnership of zoos that have been studying this, this disease for a number of years, particularly Houston and Baylor, who I think are probably a year away from a vaccine. So I think you know developing uh, treatments, developing uh, therapies for animals that are, that are sick at our zoos, in some cases, those actually may be uh, extrapolated to wild populations. So I think there's there's a lot of things on the animal health end that I'm pretty uh, fascinated with. We do some amazing work with giraffes, and and um, it's uh, it, I think we're just beginning to 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 really understand the impact that will have. Yeah, one of the giraffes was just giving blood the other day. Yeah, yeah. So. He, he got a lot more press than I Doing did. His part. Listen, <laughs> I mean, you know, he's pretty cute. He's helping out the population. So. But thank you for giving blood as well. Hi, my name is Jody Engel. I'm a proud CMC member and also a member of the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee here with CMC. And I was wondering if you could please speak to your background with DEI at your other institution. And then 
Um, it, you have great access programs, it sounds like, and um, supplier, minority supplier um, relationships. And I was just curious if you could talk about the staff and inclusive environments for guests and staff, sure. um, as well as you said you had a great relationship with OSU, so thinking about um, you know, increasing what our staff looks like and yeah. the backgrounds and barriers. Um, you know, you only have like four minutes maybe, but no. um, that'd be great. Thanks. Yeah, we, we would definitely need more time. Well, so I think it's been interesting. If, if um, I'll share with you kind of some of the pillars for our strategic plan that we're focusing on now, and, and I try to keep things fairly simple, but, but the primary pillar is really focused on animal well-being, and, and that involves the animal health, animal care, the well-being, the habitats that we create for the animals. How do we really become or continue our leadership role in that? But the other one is sustainability. So we are a 100-year-old organization. So what are the things that we need to do in the next three years, five years, 10 years to make sure that the Columbus Zoo exist 100 years from now. And, and as we started looking, and this is, unfortunately, it's a challenge that a lot of zoos face. If you look at our, particularly our keepers, uh, we, that, that group of people, they are, they are largely Caucasian, and that is not sustainable. We, we cannot have, we cannot run zoos if we only have Caucasians working as zookeepers. And so we've got to figure out a way that we can reduce the barriers and, and bring a more diverse population in to, to help care for our animals. It, it is fundamentally unsustainable. So that is part of one of our strategic plan pillars. And I think Dr. Rustin Moore at, 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 um, at OSU, who actually serves on our board, um, really, I think, has sort of captured an interesting uh, observation, and I think it's a story that we can tell really, really well at the zoo. I mean, nature can't survive if it's not diverse. Biodiversity is the fundamental premise that nature exists, and, and focusing on biodiversity and supporting biodiversity in, in the wild is, is really what drives our mission every day. We need to have the same focus on human diversity because we're just like nature, we cannot exist if we don't have diverse populations. And so I think that's really become kind of one of our core values within our DEI program. And so we're about to launch our new RISE scholarship program. We had a lot of internship programs in the past, but they were largely unpaid. And as you can imagine, you know, unpaid interns, they, they, they may come from middle to upper uh, income families and, and folks who, students that are coming from families that are, that are lower income, they can't afford to work as an unpaid intern, and so that's a barrier. So we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna launch our new RISE scholarship program in the fall, and we'll have 20 paid interns for that program, and we're gonna reach out to the schools where we can identify students that we think could be good candidates that, that maybe historically didn't have an opportunity to participate, that they will be, and we wanna continue to grow that program. So that's one piece of it, <laughs> but we're also, thank you, Donna. We, um, but even within our volunteer base, I mean, it, it, we, we've gotta make sure that first of all, we've got to identify what are the barriers, what, what is preventing folks of, of different backgrounds to, to want to become part of the zoo. And, and if, as we can continue to identify that, then we can eliminate those barriers. And I think our, our, our zoo population, our human population, will better reflect Columbus, it'll better reflect Ohio, it'll better reflect the United States because it does not today. Uh, I hope you found today's forum enlightening, informative. I mean, we, we all know. We all know the Columbus Zoo and Aquarium is just such a pillar of our community and of our city and our state, frankly, and um, it was nice to hear honest answers about getting through a very challenging time. Uh, there's a lot of bad press, but I, you can see it kind of coming out of that, and it's, I think it's linked to your leadership, Tom, so thank you for being here and answering some of those tougher questions about the issues facing the zoo. Um, if you all have not noticed already, this is always a good time. You always learn a lot when you come to a forum. We have many more coming up, including next Wednesday. Uh, we'll have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with the former Ford CEO Jim Hackett and Nancy Kramer, Global Chief Evangelist for IBM. That's sure to be an enlightening conversation. And then if you haven't checked just the uh, programs that are coming up, the forums coming up in July, a lot of good ones. Uh, obviously, there's always good diversity and variety in our forum, so please check that out. If you can't make next week, find another Wednesday. We'll be here. We always are on Wednesdays. And uh, please come by, have a lunch, and enjoy some great conversation. 
Uh, thank you, as always, to our online virtual C patrons, uh, to the Emergency Response Fund of the Columbus Foundation for presenting our live stream in partnership with the Columbus Dispatch and NBCFry.com. And, of course, special appreciation to Tom Schmidt and our host, Monica Day. And thank you all for joining us, because we can't have a conversation if it's just the three of us. Uh, I need to have more people here. Uh, so we can't do this without you. So we do look forward to seeing you here for another forum, hopefully next week or another Wednesday uh, in your schedule for another community conversation. Stay cool, everyone. I know it's hot out there, but good luck and uh, have a great day.